our live milestone. We're starting on time for a change. Yes. Hello to all of our people and fans online. We appreciate you for being there in cyberspace. Thanks for live streaming us. And to all the people in the house, thank you for making it through the wreck that I heard was outside. So everybody drive safe tonight. Yeah. Last time I did this, it was a hurricane. So yeah, you know we like to keep it spicy. Uh, so. Happy May the 4th. May the 4th be with you. It's Star Wars Day. I can tell by the lack of enthusiasm not everyone here is into Star Wars as I am. That's okay. Uh, One well, of your cohorts doesn't well, know anything either. Yeah. Well, let's, let, let me get a show of hands of people that aren't really into Star Wars or familiar with it. Are not. Are not. Are not interested. This is not to shame you. Young lady, young lady. Keep your hands up. Keep your hands up. Keep your hands up. Come on up. Come up to the stage. Yeah. Okay. Mr. Right. Did I see you raise your hand, sir? No. I saw no. El Warren raise her hand. Come on, El Warren. 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 Come on, it's called Cyborg or Smorgasbord. Cyborg. Okay. So, okay, well, we're going to touch it. Now, we are going to give our contestants, they each have uh, two tries, was it? Three, three. Uh, we're going we're gonna to show you. Oh, yeah, let me get some introductions here. Hi, I'm T. Yeah, T! T? Just T. Tell us your name. Hello, I'm L. Hello, L. Long time fan. Carrie Schwartz, we're not the same. Yeah, all right. <laughs> not, not Star Wars fan. Long time Star Wars fan. Let's get it straight. All right, all right. Okay, so the, the, the object of this game is we are going to show you two things. One of them is a Star Wars character, and one of them is not. And we're going to give you a name, and you have to match it to either the cyborg or alien or whatever Star Wars type thing it is, or whatever the other item is. Do you, all, do you think you can handle that? Sure. Okay. <laughs> well, we can start with you, T, if you like. Okay. All right. from, uh, so the name we have here, do you think you can pronounce it? Lohi Keto? Yeah, Lohi Keto. Lohi Keto. So, all which right, one I of those things is Lohi Keto? I'm assuming it's this guy. You think it's this guy? What about the audience? What do you think? Yes or no? You gotta help her out. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you think you think it's this or do you think it's this? Yeah. It's this guy. Okay, that's your answer. Let's and do the answer deal. is uh, no. Uh, no. Uh, no. Uh, this, uh, this guy is Norse eighty one, clearly. Okay. Norse, you got that? All right. Yes, Good try, T. All right. No, you hang oh. out. You hang out. You're gonna get Yeah, you're gonna get two more tries in this. Let's get a yeah. Yeah, let's do a rotation. Okay, Al. For a long. Is it a cyborg? Or is it some sort of smorgasbord of something else? <laughs> For a long. I'm gonna say I'm gonna say cyborg. Okay. Okay. Yes! He's a protocol droid! I'm gonna say ancient game. Rob Chalk. Yeah. 
Yeah, y'all clap it up for that. That's super All right, Jimmy, congratulations. All right, thanks guys for participating. Welcome everybody to Searsucker Live. This is the graphic episode. We should introduce ourselves. Yeah, we everyone should. knows you're almost trust Baranato, Almost trust But no one knows who I am. So let's get to what's really important. I am Megan Avimalamat, new board member of Sears Tucker, and I am very glad to be staring the stage with almost trust Baranato, but you can call him Chris today. Uh, for those of you who are, if this is your first time at a Sears Tucker Live event, we are a literary nonprofit. Uh, we put on uh, readings with uh, writers from around the nation and locally, and we try to keep it fast and fun. Anything to add to that? No, I mean, today's a graphic episode, so we're doing something brand new that we've not tried before. Um, it's going to be a multimedia extravaganza in more ways than one. We always have our Searsucker Live Orchestra, courtesy of Brian Dean. <laughs> multi-part readings, so you're in for a treat. Music, sound effects. Now, uh, some of you might think that we're called the graphic episode because there's, uh, you know, it's gonna be naughty. Uh, you might have come to that conclusion because if anyone visited seersuckerlive.com recently, that used to be our website, uh, we lost that domain name, and now if you look up Seersucker Live, it takes you to porn. <laughs> Uh, so for those in the audience who discovered us through SearsuckerLive.com and were expecting a different show, I apologize. Yeah, we're gonna... See, sir, yeah, I, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Please come back, I'm I, I promise you'll be good. Um, we'd like to go ahead and thank Front Porch Improv right off the top for having us, and also to the book lady for selling amazing books. Amazing books. Um, we also have got uh, QR codes posted at the exits, so you can tell us what you thought about the show, or you can donate a little bit. That feels meaningful to you to help us keep Sear Sucker going. Otherwise, tip your bartenders, there's drinks and stuff out in the front, and I think we should move on with the show. Yeah, absolutely. So I'd like to bring up our first reader, uh, Dennis Robinson. <laughs> Sure. My actor, actress is on the way. She's a professor like me, so she's coming a little later. Is oh, she's okay? going to be reading for you? Yes, she's going to be reading with me. Oh, reading with you? Improv. Oh, okay. So okay. how soon is she going to be here? She gets out of class 7.30. She'll be here by another 10 minutes. Okay. I suppose we can start with uh, Brian Ralph. Yeah. Let's bring up Brian Ralph. Storytelling, and I talk about um, comic creation and all types of genres of comics. Beautiful. So, besides being a successful writer and a and professor skateboarder. and skateboarder, <laughs> and I'm, chicken I'm, owner. I'm quoting here that you also have the premier chicken themed skate oh, arena. Yeah. That, I beat you to it. So, what was the <laughs> genesis of that idea? Uh, huh. Just a bunch of guys got together with some tools and some beer. And I, was, I said, let's build this thing. 
and it just grew and grew and grew, and then a big community of skaters got, you know, started coming to my yard, uh, and uh, just took off as sort of like an autonomous zone for skateboarding. Follow-up question. Yes. In the construction with the beer, uh, how sturdy was the first ramp y'all built? <laughs> it was very level. Oh, okay. Uh, uh, and then um, it was constructed out of some found materials, but I think the construction is solid. Uh, and then it's all, it's all, you know, whatever's underneath it, you don't see, because it's all covered. <laughs> there's, a bunch of, there's a bunch of questionable construction underneath that, but it's solid enough for thrashing. And that's what we need, right? I don't know if it's up to code, it's so solid. if there's anyone from Savannah here, uh, just, well, don't tell them where I live. And none of those chickens are roosters either, so. Yes, I did have roosters. Uh, and one thing that you don't realize is that roosters actually make noise continuously throughout the day. Yeah. It's not just a morning thing. It's not that cute. <laughs> yeah, it's not cute. Okay. And, uh, my daughter had to ask, uh, why is that rooster attacking the hen? And I said, uh, You'll, uh, I'll tell you another time. I'll tell you when you're, say it when you're older. Shout out to family and audience. <laughs> okay, final question. For those of us who might be new to graphic novels or sequential art in the audience, what would be a good um, intro graphic novel or work of sequential art that you might recommend folks uh, start with? Boy, oh boy. Well, the easiest question for that one is um, Art Spiegelman's Mouse, right? I mean, it's, yeah, it's, um, it's about to be banned, so get it while you Recently can. banned, I think, in Tennessee. Yeah. Um, oh, geez. And then for younger people, um, there's a series of books that, uh, you know, a memoir or autobiography books by uh, Raymond Templemeyer called S like Smile, Drama. There's another one called uh, S uh, Sisters. A drama was also banned. We're, we've gone through all the banned books. But those oh, are you know, really, really approachable and appealing for young people, too. But for us adults, oh, another book, if I could. Um, Art Spiegelman's Mouse, obviously, should be on everybody's shelf. Then, uh, Could you tell us briefly what that one is about for those well, who might not know? Well, it's a it's a mem it's a Art Spiegelman is talking to his father about um, the Holocaust. Well, I'm really bringing the mood down here. Uh, Art Spiegelman is talking to his father about the, uh, uh, the Holocaust and its um, sort, of, sort of recollections of that experience. And uh, I believe it was banned because it had uh, a, a nudity, the nudity in it, uh, and it may have had uh, like a not so cheery view of the Holocaust. The characters are also, yeah. also anthropomorphized oh, mice. Sure. Yeah, that's what so, yeah. mice news. Well, yes, you know, that's just one that should, I think should be, especially now that it got, uh, it's, you know, under fire or ban. It's like, we all should just get that book and just go the entire opposite direction. Yeah. I think it's, um, you know, George's bands are about making people uncomfortable. Yeah. Yeah, that's yeah. what it made people uncomfortable. Right. Okay, so you were going to add another uh, it, book oh, on top yeah. of mouse. Oh, jeez. Um, Boy, there's so many that I could I could talk about. Um, in terms, there's a, a book by a young artist named Tilly Walden called Spinning. Oh, it's which, amazing. Yeah, that that would be another like really contemporary book. So you know, Art Spiegelman's book is a you know huge a huge uh, impactful work, Pulitzer Prize winning novel. And then Tilly, a contemporary artist by uh, a contemporary young artist, uh, sort of coming out and ice skating. Mm -hmm. Beautiful. <laughs> All right, we're gonna let you read now. Thank oh, yeah. you, Ryan. Uh, all right. I, I was so distracted by the other one of my son's We need to make room for our folio. Oh, yeah, yeah, sorry. Were there any uh, skateboarding follow up questions? Uh, <laughs> the maneuver there? Any? Uh, Got a favorite skateboarder? Uh, favorite 90s skateboarder? Favorite 90s skateboarder? <laughs> oh, um, uh, not Tony Hawk, I would do two reasons. Crazy sword? Christian the Soy, though, is that 90s? That's 80s, I think. He was like a contemporary Tony as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, he had the best board, that nose shape was like oh, the best yeah. skateboard. Uh, Christian the Soy had these, a fish shaped board with all these bumps on it that they called the money bumps. Because uh, people, because people want, it, it, the more bumps you had on your board, the cooler it was and the more kids would buy it. And so they just started adding random, random uh, bumps on the board. Yeah, Christian the Soy is a good one. Let's go with that. All right, all right. We're now going to do a reading of. Oh yeah, can we set up a little? Yeah. The yeah. setup. Um, yeah. You want me to do a little? Uh, sure. Like, what's what is daybreak? Oh yeah. So daybreak. Uh, I did this book at a time in my life too, where I was doing a lot of comics and I was a little bit burnt out, and I'd lost a little bit of the the oomph for the passion for this. You know, it just became routine. And so this book, 
uh, was really unique for me. It, it, it features a, a sort of a point of view where the actual reader is a character. So uh, it's important to know that when you're watching this, like you're being spoken to by the characters. And there's, I think in this section, there you actually sort of uh, engage in some activity, which was a real challenge for me to figure out, like how can I have the audience feel like they're sort of playing this game? Uh, it had like, I don't know, it has kind of like a first person shooter perspective, I guess. This is the next best thing to Oculus Rift, guys. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know, and I was, I was so, I was jealous of the excitement around video games, and I was like, how can I make this experience as exciting as a video game? Uh, so we can, you can tell me whether or not we did it. Uh, and so there's also zombies. So. <laughs> All right. All right. Wake up. <clears throat> You'll survive. Just a flesh wound. You fell back. That's how you cracked your head open. Luckily for you, my eyesight's not what it once was. You tried to shoot us. Now hold still. How are you doing on gas? That can't be right. Did you hit the thing? You gotta hit the thing. See, half a tank. What are you so worried about? Of course we can make it on half a tank. Plus, we've got the reserve in the back. Last time I checked it. Psst. Well, why didn't you refill it then? You okay? Uh, oh, yeah. Gotta do everything myself. Damn. Make it on half a tank. All right, stop the yelling. I'll refill it. Get up. You know how to cycle gas? Got ten minutes. Go. This is your chance. It's going to kill us. Go and don't come back. Thank 
good way to get your finger cut off. What's that, dear? Uh, oh, it's nothing. Uh, sorry to keep you waiting. Old flea market. See all that fuss and we're just a few, a few miles from home.
called Come Back for a Little Bit. minutes tops. I'll ask you every question I've ever wondered so I never have to wonder about you again. Think of you in sweet epitaphs, always yellow, how nice and endless August. Come back for a little bit and I'll give you my best pillow for sleeping. If you sleep, rest your head at least. We can color, finish a puzzle, my cat wants to meet you. The couch wants your body back. The air misses the space you took up. Me too, I whisper. Yes, I'm talking to air now. There is nothing new to say about grief. The most ancient heartbreak, an insatiable love, lives just before the cusp of spring before the satisfaction of the first sunny day, where the pleas of millions of people across time sing what is left to carry. Come back for a little bit, please. also find it uh, at the books bus um, you can request it at the library and yeah I think that's about it you can follow me on Instagram at Elmore and Writes and come to my poetry open mic on Mondays oh yeah at Starlin Yard 6 30 6 30 p.m. yeah cool thank you all cool. thanks y'all <laughs> Dennis, are you ready? Yes. All right, now we're getting Dennis out. Welcome to Sears Circle Live. And what's your name? Hannah. Hannah? Hi. So uh, I always have to ask, um, who the hell are you? Hi, I'm Dennis. All right. <laughs> OK. Uh, I spoke to you a lot during the process of this book, yes. and uh, I want to know what was more difficult, writing it, illustrating it, or dealing with book printers? Uh, book printers. <laughs> <laughs> Can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, so, uh, self-publishing sucks. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, as uh, Chris mentioned before, uh, when I was a student, I was working on a uh, book, and um, that was the easy part, writing it, as well as doing the illustrations, which was fun, but when it got down to the print, uh, publishing the book, it took a year and some change since, um, uh, and Chris was uh, part of it. Uh, went through one company and they couldn't get it right, and it, got, it went from here, and the quality started going there. And then uh, I ended up uh, finishing up at Amazon because at least they are um, consistent. Did one come back and it was just like done all in crayon, like something? Basically, like yeah, and they had little glue stuck on there, like what's going on? Yeah. Uh, could you recommend? Uh, do you read? Graphic novels or sequential art at all? I read my buddies. <laughs> okay, do, do you want to recommend one? Uh, well, they work for other people. So I would say uh, Danny is cool. Uh, I can never pronounce her last name, and I'm horrible at it. Sorry, Danny. Um, is that again what? Chuatico. 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 Thank you. Matt, you're the one that pronounces everything offensive. Yeah. So, uh, <laughs> and um, um, Lynn. Oh, <laughs> Lynn, I think it's uh, just Yen. Yen Yu Ji Yen. When? 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 Oh, see, see, no. See, look. There we go. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. So he's known. There it is. All right. <laughs> and uh, you all got that, so you can find those books. <laughs> uh, all right. Uh, Dennis Robinson. Thank Have you. at it. All right. Um. So my book is a little different. It's uh, basically, um, 
I love sequential, but sequential is very, um, what is it called? Not uh, very uh, labor intensive. So uh, I got my MFA in illustration, so I'm an illustrator that wrote a book. I'm calling this my uh, art book novel. <laughs> so um, the prologue uh, of uh, the uh, beginning. So be weary as you are forewarned of the turmoil that lies ahead. Brace yourselves before turning the next page. For you will learn the peculiar story of a young girl whose world suddenly went from ordinary to just plain weird. Gwen tells of a typical girl, a uh, typical girl in an ordinary world until that one fateful night changed everything. So turn the page if you dare, but know that you were warned fool. And then we have that, that image there. And then we turn the page again. Chapter one, Gwen, the bear, and the otherworldly deal. In a dark yet cozy room filled with all the delights a little girl would love lies an ordinary girl by the name of Gwen Tales. There she lies in her ordinary bed, apparently having an enjoyable yet ordinary dream, when something very unordinary begins to happen. Gwen slowly opens her eyes, awakened by rustling. It is coming from a corner in her bedroom, rustling again, this time closer, right at the edge of her, footboard, her bed's footboard. Now there's silence. Gwen freezes with fright and stares at the darkness towards the bedroom, bedroom's light switch. Mustering enough courage to sit up, she slowly reaches with a trembling hand to turn on her rescuer, the light. All this is just in my imagination, she tells herself as she takes another breath. She quickly flips on the light. She lets out a sigh of relief when she sees that her room is just as she left it. Unfortunately, that relief is short-lived once she noticed a trail of her stuffed animals leading to the edge of her footboard. Gwen hearts begin to run a marathon as she looks around for what or who broke her sleep. She carefully crawls to the bed, bed, bottom of the bed towards the footboard. She grips her blanket for comfort while hoping once again that it's all just a dream. The only thing standing between her and the other side of her footboard is the blanket she now hides under. Closing her eyes, she gives one last steam of courage. She slowly peers over the footboard. There's no turning back now. Gwen thinks, as she, her, thinks to herself as her eyes finally emerges from the blanket, her blanket of reassurance. On the other side, she sees the panda king teddy bear, which is her favorite toy, by the way, standing. Gwen leans towards her object of interest, only to see it's inching towards her. She stops. Hopping, hoping that her eyes stop tricking her. To her dismay, the teddy bear continues to move towards her inch by inch. Without warning, the stuffed bear begins shouting. Gwen does what, uh, what any girl in fear would do. She runs, well, more like jumps back, looks around, and grabs the nearest objects. I mean, the nearest objects, brushes, pillows, and books from the nightstand, and more. They all fly across the room, meeting the face of the unexpected, loudmouth, angry teddy bear. Suddenly, it yells, Holt! An awkward silence engulfs the room. Grasping a snow glove, Gwen suddenly has the urge to speak. What do you mean, Holt? You're a freaking talking teddy bear. <laughs> With a puzzling face, the teddy bear looks around. Teddy bear? What is this teddy bear you speak of, foolish girl? He hops up on, on, the, on the footboard and turns towards the vanity mirror in the distance. His face falls in frustration as he views a reflection of a stuffed bear, a uh, stuffed panda bear. What the? How the? I don't believe this. How did I get in this bed? This this toy? The teddy bear goes on. Gwen's listen. Gwen's continues listening. Now more confused about the situation than before. I can't believe this. I am the law marvelous Magus, and how did I get in this in this predicament? Suddenly, with an owl-like twist, Magus turns toward the, bewil the bewildered Gwen with an evil glare. It had to be you. Overcome with anger, Gwen looks at the, her once favorite stuffed animal. What are you talking about? You woke me out of my sleep. She says as, the, as she adjusts her grip on the snow, snow globe in her hand. So how did I, hmm, impudent little girl? Or are you really a little girl? Maybe you're a little demon sprite that's here to torment me, shouts Magus as he walks across the uh, bed towards Gwen. Gwen prepares to strike. Magus stops in fright. Gwen yells. I'm a human, a girl. Besides, look who's talking. You're a teddy bear. Who's the demon sprite tormenting whom? The room, the room fills once again with a silence as the two stare each other down. Finally, the silence is broken by a familiar voice echoing down the hallway. <coughs> Excuse me. 
I'm gonna try to do this. Gwen? Gwen? Are you all right? Gwen questions the familiar voice. I heard shouting. Gwen looks at Magus with a punishing stare and replies. Um, it's, it's okay. Um, I just had a, a really weird dream, that's all. Did you drink milk before you went to sleep? <laughs> Sorry. Because you have, you, you know how you have bad dreams when you? No, 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 it's all good. Gwen quickly replies to end the conversation. Okay, honey, get some rest because tomorrow's going to be a busy day. Gwen <laughs> says before she uh, silence fills the room once more. <clears throat> Gwen turns around, hoping that Magus was just her imagination. Unfortunately, she is reminded quickly of his existence as he's now looking, looking into the mirror even more astonished and irritated ir 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 than before. <sighs> I have to figure out how to fix this situation, he tells himself. Wait, this isn't all on me. She, calls, she, she closes her eyes. Okay, Gwen, it's time to wake up now. She, tells her, she keeps telling herself until she feels a slight weight behind, uh, beside her. She slowly opens one eye to reveal Magus standing on his tiptoes right in her face. So, demon sprite, sprite, what are we going to do about our little situation of ours? He asks. Our situation? Heck, I, I don't know. Like I said earlier, you're the one that woke me up. I don't even know where you're from. All right, here we have that. <laughs> so that's Magus. Um, I don't know how much time we have. We good? Oh, okay, cool. All right. Um, so, you don't believe you have anything to do with this dilemma? Gwen gives Magus an ill look of absolutely not. Magus' face uh, shows a sign of defeat as he drags his feet to the edge of the bed, then flops down. Now feeling uh, miserable and discouraged, he lowers his head down on his stuffed belly. I guess it's a hopeless situation for the marvelous Magus. Then he comes to sit. Uh, he comes to sit. There, as oh, excuse me, he co continues to sit there as he is, if, as if he is in a deep thought, trying to grasp the whole situation. Moments later, he jumps up off the bed with an idea and a determined glimmer in his eye. Maybe if I get back to my body, I can find a way to get back in. Gwen pauses for a second with her chin resting on on her hand, looking at the once scared situation, and then replies sarcastically. Oh, so you need my help, little teddy bear? The glimmer quickly leaves Magus' eyes, replaced with a look of irritation towards the thorn of his foot by the name of Gwen. I don't need your help from a vile little imp sprite. I'm helping you to get your little world back to normal. Then you can go back to your little spritey ways. Gwen folds to her arms and looks at Magus with a smirk of pleasure as he continues. Besides, you don't want me around because I can make your life a living. Okay, okay. I guess we have a deal then, since this is all just a dream anyway. It's not real. So let me just get it straight. I'll get you back to your body, somehow help you get back in it, and then I'll wake up, right? Cool. Gwen looks at Magus, expecting him, expecting, I mean, expecting him to answer, only to see him looking at her confused. At any rate, I guess you can believe what you want as long as I get back to my original body, he says as they both shake hands and seal the deal. Besides, you must have had some hand in this mis my, in my misfortune because the evidence shows that all, out of all places I end up in this infernal room, you are definitely helping me to fix your wrong. Whatever, sure. But before we go, I've got a couple of things that I have to get for the road. Gwen jumps off the bed and races to the closet. She grabs her sketchbook, a couple of pencils, and anything else that, that she thinks will be useful for the journey. She quickly tosses them into her sling bag. At last, sorry. She grabs her scarf and, ready to go, turns around to walk towards the imp uh, impatient Magus, who is tapping his foot with, the stub with his stubby little arms crossed. With a roll of the eye and a deep sigh, Gwen walks towards him. As she passes by her bed, she steps on an old, crummy-looking book. Looking down, she sees it. it's the one she found earlier that day. Also, the book that, Mag that met Magus's face. <laughs> Nonchalantly, she throws it in her bag as well. Okay, Magus. Where are we going? Uptown? Downtown? Magus folds his, folds his whole hands and looks at her puzzle. What's this downtown and uptown you're rambling about? It's all, it's, oh, sorry. It's all, um, oh, excuse me. Is all of this a bit too much for you? Magus points at Gwen. Are you losing your marbles? No, those are directions to places. Places where your body might be. 
says Gwen. An expression of relief falls on Magus's face as he tries to explain his bodily situation. Ah, my little sprite, you're talking about where my body might be. I know where that is. Where? It would, it would be what you would call the other world. Other world? Hold, hold up. You didn't mention any of this. Other worldness? Why can't I wake up? Oh, I feel like I'm losing my mind. Gwen drops her bag and puts her hand on her hip and glares at Magus. No, I've got to be crazy to be listening to a talking teddy bear. I'm going to lie down until I can wake up. Back in reality, no other world. Before Gwen can take another step, Magus runs past her, hops on the edge of the footboard, and points his hand at her. Little half-witted sprite, we had a bargain, remember? Or do you want me to shout out so loud that dear old mommy can come running? Maybe then we'll see if this is all really a little, dream, uh, little old dream, hmm? Go ahead then. I don't care, little toy. Magus' face swells with anger just as he's about to part, part his cotton-filled mouth to shout. A aura begins to form in the vanity mirror. The two turn to the mirror to view a greenish purple mist flowing out of the bedroom floor onto the bedroom floor. Gwen jumps onto the bed, grabs Magus for comfort, and squeezes him out of terror. What are you doing to me, torment, tormentor? Your sprite death hole will not take my life. Away, 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 I say, shouts Magus as he grasps for air. Grim releases him and he falls on the bed. I'm sorry, Magus, but I'm, I'm actually just scared. Child, it's just the other world entrance. Gwen looks back at the mirror, and, and an image reflects from the glass. Interrupt me, excuse me. Interrupting her gaze is Magus coughing for, uh, from his comfort squeeze. Magus, you said it's the Sorry, entrance to the other world. Again? Siri, you're not a part of this. Go ahead. <laughs> Magus, you said it's the entrance to the other world, but why? Why is it in my mirror? How the heck did that happen? How did it open? I saw you go. Okay. Uh, now breathing calmly, Magus jumps off the bed onto the misty floor. Yes, on the misty floor towards the mirror. Obviously, it's well. It was opened when I entered. Okay. Well, since you know it all, then how and why did it open in the first place? How should I know? I was the one drawn here and somehow ended up in this infernal toy. Besides, it's opened up. It's open now, and this might be the only way back to the other world. When looks around at all the thick mist which is now all over her bedroom floor. She eases her right foot onto the ground. To her surprise, the mist is warm. After, after a breath of courage, she grabs her bag and heads towards the eerie mirror on the dresser. Climbing to the top of her nightstand, Gwen looks at Magus and asks, So I just crawl through this mirror? Magus looks at her with a disappointed glare. Obviously, he says, anxious to get, anxious to get going. I have this huge feeling that I'm going to regret this. You're lucky that I'm a girl with my word. She reaches her hand towards the misty portal as the fall consumes to, I mean, continues to flow out of the reflection. Gwen pulls her hands back for a brief second, but, the, but then remembers her deal and puts her hand through the foggy mirror. Oh, it's warm, too. Right. Magus can, can take no more of Gwen's delay and rushes onto the bed. He jumps and flies towards Gwen's back, muttering, this foolish sprite. Gwen's back, back meets the Magus force, knocking her into the mirror. Abruptly, Magus follows after her. A blinding light suddenly illuminates from the glass. All of the mist is consumed back into, this, back into that, the now swirling portal, and to the room is clear of the ore. The glowing mirror continues to swirl until Gwen's ordinary room fills the mirror's reflection once again. Do you have books available up front? Yes, um, so I have uh, books available now. I went ahead and ordered, uh, I got a couple copies I can sign and stuff like that. Um, I'm sorry, I just love. Um, get your book now so you don't have to worry about the shipping of two weeks. You know how Amazon goes. You can get on Amazon though. Um, you get on Amazon, uh, it's available on Amazon, this book, uh, the coloring book. Uh, all the images that you see here are actually able for you to color, color Green's universe. And I also have a digital book as well, all on Amazon. Cool. Beautiful. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. So now we have a treat for you all. Chris Baronado has composed an original song about his very favorite, most handsome Star Wars character, J. 
just named after him. Um, and it is becoming a bit of a family affair, I believe, the performance of this song. Yeah. So without further ado, please clap it up for Chris Granato. <laughs> If no one's noticed, my wife Courtney's up front here dressed like Princess Leia. <laughs> we'll see her later on the show. All right. Do you want to tell them? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, I should set this up. This is uh, from a friend of mine, Ben Acker, and his writing partner, Ben Blacker. Can you imagine? They're Acker and Blacker. Uh, and they're lifelong writing pet partners right now. And uh, they wrote a Star Wars comic to tie in with The Last Jedi called The Storms of Crate. It is about Princess Leia, Han Solo, and Luke Skywalker trying to find a new secret base. It ends up being Hoth and Empire Strikes Back, but first they go to Crate, which is like a, a salt planet. Who's that young kid playing? Oh, this is my son, Max. Yeah, Max! Hey! He is my cowbell player. Yeah. All right. And, and so, Chris, so this is... Trust Baronado. Trust Baronado. Trust Baronado is the, the the foil in this story, and I guess that's all you need to know. You'll hear the rest in the song there. So, all right, let's start. <laughs> base and I have just the place. It's called Crate and it's pretty cool. <laughs> the mines are salty but look good for hiding. It's fortified. It's perfect for fighting. If your droids were here today, C3PO would say, Demo Arigato. <laughs> Trust <laughs> very much. <laughs> Don't let my vibes make you act crash. Is it the way that I grow my evil mustache? Thank you. 
This is how I get people to force people to listen to my music. If I put it on Spotify, no one would ever listen to it. <laughs> uh, okay, uh, I'd like to bring up uh, Andre, Andre Fertino. Come on up. Sit or stand. Whatever you want to do. Stand. So who the hell are you? <laughs> uh, my name is uh, Andre Pertino. I am a uh, graphic novelist, and uh, I am here at Cedar Suckers Live, uh, which is probably the most awesome event I've seen this whole year. So. Thank you. Uh, you have a new work coming out soon involving some people's uh, favorite multicolored teenage heroes, um, the Mighty Morphin Power Rangers. Can you, uh, can you tell me who your favorite ranger is? You know, it's funny. My mom would not let me watch the Mighty Morphin Power Rangers as a kid because there was a whole thing going on with like kids were playing as the Power Rangers and yeah. getting injured. It was okay if I watched a bunch of mutant Ninja Turtles fight, but I couldn't watch these five super colorful, like, you know, ninja warriors. So when I got this job, I called my mom and go, you never let me watch any of these Power Rangers. I'm in a deficit now. Now I've got to go back and rewatch all this stuff and read all the comic books, but it's been a lot of fun, so. What about uh, all the Japanese stuff, the Super Sentai I did stuff? not watch all of that. But I will say that I think my favorite Power Ranger was probably Billy. I love the Blue Ranger, so. I love Blue. Blue's my favorite comic. All right. Uh, could you recommend, uh a work of sequential art for people to start. You know, uh, Brian beat me with it. Awesome. I wasn't the same mouse. Um, but I think that, you know, uh, I was thinking in the back there about some other graphic novels. I would recommend anything from Gene Yuluin Yang. Uh, in particular, probably in a lead up for his upcoming TV show, uh, American Born Chinese. Uh, but I would also say that, you know, since this is a room full of literary connoisseurs and aficionados, um, I would read Scott McCloud's Understanding Comics. It's kind of a technical manual, but if you're new in the comic books and you haven't actually understood it, it's actually probably the holy bible for most of us that work in sequential art, and it will give you a really good practical, you know, technical understanding of how we as comic book artists and writers create the world of sequential storytelling. So can you tell us a little bit about the work we're going to be reading from today? So uh, Tokyo Rose Zero Hour is based on the true story of Aiva Tagori. She is a Japanese American woman who, while visiting her family in Japan, um, against her uh, wishes, she actually did not want to go to Japan, but her mother made her move and go down there. Uh, she ends up stuck there during the onset of World War II. Uh, the Japanese government tries to get her to renege her American citizenship, and she refuses and um, however ends up being a part of radio propaganda for the Japanese military but secretly sabotaging it alongside other allied POWs in the war. Uh, she becomes known as the infamous Tokyo Rose who was a sort of urban legend amongst the allied troops during World War II and returns back to America afterwards and still suffers a horrible fate of persecution and uh, and discrimination um, here in the U.S. Uh, how did you uh, discover the story? What interested you in uh, you know doing the book about it? Uh, I've always been big in the World War II. My other graphic novel with Image Comics is called Simon Says. Uh, it's a graphic novel about Simon Wiesenthal, the Jewish Nazi hunter. Uh, World War II, in my mind, is probably and hopefully the clearest version we've had of good versus evil in modern war. Probably a lot of what we've you know, seen as the inspiration for Star Wars today came from you know, the tragedies of World War II. Uh, I can't tell you the moment that I thought about Tokyo Rose and Iba Tagori and, and this story, but there was a time that I didn't know about it, and then a time instantly afterwards where I could not not do this book. Um, and to me, it's not so much my own penmanship, it's not my authoring of it. This is kind of a steward position. You know, Iba's story is true. This is through a lot of research and, and you know, uh, reading up on this, this particular person in American and world history. And so it's her story that uh, I feel as, as a writer and an author that we're just trying to translate it for our modern readers and people who, you know, the next generation of graphic novel readers as well. Plus my grandfather was a uh, Marine in the uh, First Division during World War II. 
He was at Pearl Harbor when they got attacked. He went on to fight at Guadalcanal, Okinawa, Iwo Jima. Uh, essentially, if you've ever seen HBO's The Pacific, that was him. Um, so this is kind of a tribute to him. And he actually makes a cameo appearance in uh, our reading tonight as uh, Stanley Kaczynski, which was my grandfather's name. Uh, real quick, you uh, you wrote this book, uh, but who did who illustrated? Who did you work yes. with? So uh, the art is done by the amazing Kate Casano. Uh We both went to SCAD together many many moons ago. Uh, we had our first sequential art class together, and when I saw her, I was like, I've got to work with you at some point in the future. Uh, and then the lettering is done by the amazing Janice Chang. Uh, Janice is a 40 plus year veteran within comic book lettering. She's worked with Stan Lee. She's worked with Marvel and DC. Uh, she works with Storm King, which is John Carpenter's graphic novel imprint. And she uh, is actually working with Jean Yang. She did Superman Smashes the Klan. Uh, so bringing her on board was a really uh, great kind of nod uh, to just somebody who's worked in the industry. She was an active civil rights uh, uh, contributor um, and trying to help Asian Americans' uh, voices be heard. And so for her to be able to do the, essentially the voice for Iva in this story is pretty symbolic. Does this uh, scene need, need any uh, setting up before we get into it? All you need to know is that these first couple of pages are real life. This was my grandfather leaving uh, a Catholic church right as the uh, Japanese were attacking it in Pearl Harbor in December of 1941. So enjoy. Thank you. Thank you. Gino Orlandi. He was our Foley artist for the previous reading. And this is my wife, Courtney Bernardo, and a Princess Leia, uh, Princess Leia. Princess Leia in glasses, which is kind of a fantasy of mine, but you know. <laughs> special high police known as the Toko, or the Thought Police, if you prefer. Thought Police? I came to speak to you about your citizenship. This is because of the war, right? You're here to arrest me? Quite the contrary. We're here to free you. We are now offering all Nisei an opportunity to forfeit their American citizenship in favor of becoming full-fledged Japanese citizens with all the liberties and privileges that come with it. But I'm an American. I don't really want to be Japanese. Ah, I don't believe you understand. To continue your life normally, you must become Japanese. Continuing as an American risks much discomfort. I see. I will, of course, give you time to consider. We will be in the area speaking with other Nisei. It is not yet 
a crime to be a Nisei, but it does mean continued scrutiny from imperial law, which can be most severe. Good day to you both. That evening. Sure is quiet here tonight. Lots on everybody's minds. There is, in fact. I believe it would be best if you remained at home from now on. Maintain your chores here and refrain from public responsibilities. You do? I do. As a Nisei, you risk bringing dishonor upon yourself as an unwanted foreigner. I see. Then what you really mean is that I bring you dishonor to you. You're afraid they'll know you have a Western dog living in your home, isn't it? Uh, no, you, you misunderstand. Yes, it is. You may be my sister's daughter, but you truly do not understand the way of things here and how difficult your existence is for us. You make it hard for us not only to live, but also to survive. Well, let me make it a little easier for you all. This is not necessary. Ivo, please, reconsider. You are still family. No, I'm not. I'm just a damn Nisei. I'm the enemy of the Empire. And I'm an American. Well, this is the room. Do you like it? Only 50 cent a month? It'll do. Here's the first deposit. This has been a very good week. <laughs> Ever since war was declared, Nisei have been flooding in like rats deserting a sinking ship. Dear June, I have no clue whether or not you'll ever read this. I heard what happened in Hawaii. I'm sick to my stomach. Things here went from bad to worse when the news broke. I left the family and have struck out on my own. I think I caught Annie, Auntie doing a little dance when I went out the door. I rented a very small apartment in the city of Tokyo. The landlady caters to those of us stuck here on the wrong side of the Pacific. It's at least comforting to know that I'm surrounded by others who didn't get out while the getting was good. I feel like such a screw up. And of course I have my music. To the people of Japan, though, I went from being a mild curiosity to a full enemy combatant. The angry glares, the hushed voices, the smug attitudes. You'd think we'd attack them instead of the other way around. Even the children are after me. Just yesterday, three little boys started throwing rocks at me as I was crossing the street. I think I still have a lump on the side of, like the size of a baseball in my head. The scariest of it is, though, the thought police. They're rounding up Japanese Americans and giving them a choice, either to give up their American citizenship or become a Japanese subject, or face fines, persecutions, or even jail time. And so many Nisei are giving up their citizenship willingly. Not me, though. I won't forget where I come from and who I am. I have never been prouder to be an American. I just know that our boys will make it so I can come home soon. Hold the ponies, I'm coming. Aye, aye, aye. Mr. Taguri? Yes? Is there a problem, sir? Mr. Taguri, you and your family are being relocated. Relocated? Now? Yes, sir. It's a matter of national security. Please gather your family and pack your bags. Bring enough for more than a week's stay. But, but my shop. Look here, Squinty. He told you twice already. Get your yellow button gear and no more questions. You understand? I'll get my family. We'll come with you. Japanese authorities are reviewing all correspondence that goes in and out. 
out of the country before they even hand it to the carriers. But I want you to do me a favor, and it's a big one. Don't give up on me. Know that I'm sticking to my guns and staying true red, white, and blue. Give, me, give my love to all, no matter how far I am away from home, I'll always be thinking of you and the family. I promise that I will be home soon. Love, Iva. Thank you. Thank you.